Hello and most welcome to 838 uh, of the Heidegger series. Uh, we're lucky here to have a rather sunny day and I found a sunny uh, calm spot here in the corner of the yard. And I hope you're all well when this is received and I will have a look see into the chain of the mirror once more and I also would like to explain a little bit what is the chain of the mirror what does it allure to well it's the tin foil that you find at the back of the glass it's the tin foil that makes the mirror a mirror Otherwise, it would just be a piece of glass. So it's the combination of tin foil and the glass that make up the mirror. And the question is, at what specific instance do the reflection happen? And as we all know, when we look into a mirror, it could be hard to say precisely where is the reflection situated? Let me read the following aside from dissemination. Dissemination, uh, I think, is in the, from the translation of Spivak. Uh, the breakthrough toward radical otherness with respect to the philosophical concept of the concept always takes within philosophy the form of an a posteriority or an empiricism the form that's the important thing here and it's an a posteriority it's after you might say after the collapse of the wave it's an afterthought as well and the mirror reflection is also an after effect an after illusion you might call it an illusion let me continue but this is an effect of the specular nature of philosophical reflection philosophy being incapable of inscribing in parenthesis comprehending what is outside it otherwise than through the appropriating assimilation of a negative image and Dissemination is written on the back, the chain of that mirror. So a negative image, it's not, as you think, something bad. It's the other effect, what you see in the mirror. That is usually called a negative. It's a word you often use uh, earlier when we spoke about film, the film in say the camera was a negative was a reflection what the camera had captured from the outside but dissemination itself is written on the back in the very chain of that mirror so where is it situated and I think that is the important question here where exactly is it situated? So one might say we go to the a priori before we even start to divide or establish. It reminds me uh, 
about that longest English word. I cannot pronounce this, but it's something similar of anti-disestablishment movement, something like that. But it's before something is established, before the very establishment. And that, of course, it is what makes this book so great. You are no longer already captured by the mirror image. You are free to choose in a way that is completely free. And that gives you all opportunities to say exactly that you want and to be exactly that you want. Sorry about this change of clothing here. It was a bit too warm. Let's see if I can do this in a really just manner. Sorry about that. Managed to keep it rather neat and special. Uh, it's before the closing of the American mind. It's before the closing of the Muslim mind. It's before the closing of your own reflective thinking or being. It is already always closed. Rudolf Gachet managed to sneak behind the mirror and look at the very tame, the little flimsy reflective material at the back of the mirror. And I'm realizing slowly here, um, it takes some time, the book is tough, there's no doubt about that. Could be one of the toughest book I ever encountered. But what it does, it, it managed to pave the way into the incredible work of Derrida. And when I realize so many others of Derrida's interpreter, like Spivak, for instance, they have stranded somewhere mid in between the mirror and the tame, and therefore constricted their understanding to a variant level. It's always a matter of a degree. But there is a stuckedness I haven't noticed before. The book is dealing with unlimited thinking. A thinking that is not constricted from the very beginning, whereas all other discourse, all other philosophical, ideological, political, you name it, all sorts of writing, whatever that is, is always already constricted. Or at least they bear the mirror image of constriction. The constriction is a voluntary movement from the reader. It's an active process. And I, that might be the most fascinating, that it is an active process for me as a reader, observer, hearer, perceiver. But nonetheless, it is very, very hard to get under. It's very, very hard to get under the little distance, micromillimeters between the glass and the tame.
it's very close but it is not completely closed there is an opening in between the tail and the glass and that opening makes it possible to have complete freedom not constricted freedom but a total freedom where you will be able to choose your own path in the thinking and that's why I perceive the whole thing the book in itself as a teacher of a method it's an activity it's something that you actually do you are not a passive negator that is the uh, significance of this negative image you're not just the mirror image there is a possibility to an activity something is happening between the glass and the tain and in this little distance there is absolute freedom so it's a liberation of thought and I would say that is not a small business that is possibly the most important of all If you want to make a play of word, I just constructed one. Uh, the etymology of tain is from the old French word etain. And etain just needs a specular S. Put that in between and you get a stain. Or a stain. Put a little speculative as like in speculum inside a tan and you get the mirror reflection and it is like it's always already been there like the world has always already been there but all of a sudden when you sneak in behind <clears throat> you will notice things never were established things were not cut in stone from the beginning and in this opening is actually the very life energy this is we as individuals like living beings breathing having a pulsating heart within our chest being alive And as Gachet points out, it is not enough, and this is a view he shared with Paul de Man, to dwell into Derrida's deconstruction. That will never ever be enough for you yourself wanting to do deconstruction, or what you should call it. It does obey certain law deconstruction and it follows intentions and these intentions are not the ones that underlie Derrida's philosophical enterprise and I think that could be the actual zest of part of the book and this is something I struggled with during the years I read Derrida, I love Derrida, 
but once I'm coming to do it myself, I've seen myself always having to copy what Daddy Da did. But now I'm coming to the understanding that I need to have a description of the actual process and thereby I will be able to learn rather than just imitating. And I think that is one of the reasons I mentioned two, three lectures ago that there have been rather severe criticism of Derrida from not being precise enough, not being clear enough. But here it becomes obviously clear that that clarity comes when you go behind what is supposed to be understood already and what limits what you can think, say and do. I think a uh, second way of thinking of the whole thing. We know, yeah, we discussed a lot, and this is also the view of Ian McKilchrist, there is a passivity in our original thinking. A stain seems to be established as a passivity, as looking at the word as a, a posteriority, after the things have already happened. But with a method, we can go behind that. We can open up this establishment and in the process we will be able to reconstruct reality and this reconstruction is the very energy. This is doing and this is also the possibility of seeing openings where openings weren't possible. So you, you can get locked down in an area where there is no escape and I would say that area is something I was struck with myself for many many years the idea of there is only one identity the self-identity where I am identical to myself and I have a substantial essence somewhere. An essence I can only reach indirectly. And what he does, uh, his uh, movement, so to speak, in the book is uh, for the first. Um, firstly, is to situate and interpret Derrida's philosophy with respect to one particular philosophical problem and its history. And that is the criticism of the notion of reflexiv reflexivity. The second he wants to do is choosing a form of presentation developed since Aristotle that proceeds by logical dependency. He also linked together a multitude of motifs in Derrida's oeuvre in order to demonstrate the consistent nature of this philosophical enterprise and to attempt to systemize some of its results and the reason for presenting it in this uh, logical manner is that that is the general language it is like a translation that we can understand and logical syllogism structured ordered thinking 
is conveying, so to speak, the unordered thinking of deconstruction. That is part and parcel of the project of Rodolphe Caché by clearly using the language of logic he makes sure this will stick we would fully understand it whereas at the very same time we do not get stuck by the underlying gravity of logic we we are not becoming locked by logic and this, of course, can be compared to the opening of logic made by uh, Graham Priest, the opening of mathematics made by Bishop, and of course, one could also say the opening up of physics made by the pioneers in quantum mechanics like Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, et al. It's in this opening up process you get much more opportunities for criticism, constructive criticism, or new thinking. This is the very core of what is asymmetric thinking coming from Edward de Bono. Opening up thinking that has been locked somehow in history and seeing it is the very act of reflexivity that locks it, not the text itself. It's in the reflection the lock comes. It's also the reflection that causes this, I would say, shared by everyone in the Western Hemisphere, this sense of everything being closed, finished and set. The third thing uh, Rudolf Gachet is trying to do, and succeed, I would say, is to develop these concerns by analyzing a series of Derrida, Derri, Derridian, <laughs> very hard to pronounce, sorry about that, Derridian concepts that have been absorbed into deconstructionist criticism. And he's trying to clarify their philosophical status in Derrida's work and this is a threefold intention that broadly corresponds to the three parts he has in his book and the broadness is extensive following works of uh, Derrida is, is taken up extensively and clearly expounded uh, the archaeology of the frivolous Dissemination, one of my favorites, Limited incorporated his attack on John Searle. Uh, the margins of philosophy, uh, another one that I really like, uh, and that is Hassel's book, The Margins of Philosophy. No, sorry, uh, <laughs> Edmund Hassel's Origin of Geometry. And then we have another rather nice book, and that is of Grammatology. Positions by A. Bess, Spur, or Spur, would be in German, Nietzsche's styles, speech and phenomena, La Verité, En Peinture, a book I haven't even read, and Writing and Difference, another favorite of mine. And slowly, and in this very processed threefold manner, he, in the third part, goes through what you need to know to do to become your own destructionist. And that cannot be done only by absorbing 
the material already done by Derrida. So, sort of, a, sort of say, you become a Derrida of yourself, <laughs> of your own design, or how should I put this? Uh, it gives you the possibility of using the tools of deconstructionism in whatever area you choose. And you can also, as I am uh, rather interested, use it for yourself. Because I claim that we really need the constructionist movement in our own body-mind system. Because it is causing havoc. The Ten of the Mirror is something very important for each and everyone. And hopefully with some few lectures I will be more able to transmit the, the idea of the method that uh, Rodolphe Cachet is so clearly expounding and clarifying. So uh, it would be a little easier to, for me also to dwell into the book because it is massive. It, almost takes that you are familiar with even more of Derrida, even more. But I am quite certain it can be done with the knowledge I already have. So, rather interesting project, and I'm glad I have the book with me, so I will be able to really go in as deep as possible. Together we're a little blow on my vapor and maybe cappuccino in the nearby cafe shop. I think that's enough. But just now I return with a, a little more detailed and deepening of what Rudolf Gachet is hinting at. And I say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon. Do enjoy. Bye bye. bye.